I'm Stephanie. Hi, I'm Angela. We are the Ink Mages. Join us as we discuss all things fantasy, world building, story craft, myths and legends, and of course, our own imaginative stories. Welcome to the Ink Mages podcast. We're so excited you have joined us. Today, we are going to be doing a writing tip episode, and we are going to be tackling avoiding the first page and chapter one pitfalls. So we're super excited about this one, and I have composed seven tips to help you avoid <laughs> making mistakes in your first chapter. So let's start with tip one. This is, a, this is the biggest one. Don't explain. Yes. Just don't. <laughs> Basically, don't info dump in your first chapter. Tell the readers only what is necessary to understand the opening scene. You can save explanations for later. You just really want to immerse the readers right into the world without all these explanations that they have to know. I think especially that's what kind of draws people away from reading fantasy is they think, oh no, I'm going to be bombarded with all these names, kingdoms, and too much world building. So keep it simple and just only tell what is necessary. So that I was really guilty of that when I wrote my first, <laughs> my first version of the Once in Future Chronicles was that I thought I had to do all of the world building and all of the prehistory and all of the stuff right at the beginning so that people would know what was going on. And I info dumped, like, I think my entire, like, first two chapters, <laughs> the first one was just info dump. And um, I learned really quickly that, oh, you know, all of these things could be told throughout the story and don't need to be told right at the beginning. And, you know, I thought it was really exciting world building, but apparently <laughs> reading all of that world building and all of those like historical details that I think are, were so important was really boring for the reader and made it seem to the reader like this was going to be too hard to read and too advanced and have too mm. much that they were going to have to know and understand to even read the story. And that was definitely definitely not what I wanted to convey. Yeah, exactly. And that will get to one of our tips about why we should focus on your main character, opening with your character. So when it comes to explaining, I have a simple rule and it's called the Steph's one sentence rule. So this is if you do need to explain something, do it quickly and concisely so it flows naturally and you move back into the action. And yes. I have a very quick little example from my book, The Conjurer's Curse. So at the very bottom of the first page, Rowan is going to be doing this rite of passage. And it uh, his guardian mother says, remember what I've taught you. And you'll pass the trial. And it's the more Nisi Najahi, the warrior trial to vanquish his first twin tail panther on his own. That's it. One sentence. Simple. I explain it. And we keep going. Because I think it's like, oh, I need to explain this and like do a whole paragraph of like what it really means. But then that can bog down the story. We want yeah. to stay in the action. So if you do have to like define a term and it needs to be explained for it to make sense, just one sentence and keep going. So chapter one is more about raising questions than answering them. So it's okay to keep that mystery for the readers. I think I also have a term yeah. for Rowan called Daikili and I've mentioned it three times before I actually tell you what is it is when it becomes important. It's kind of like, oh, what does that mean? But then it, once it gets explained, it's like, ah, now, now this makes sense. I think that's so important to understand because uh, it's good to leave mystery. It's good to not quickly resolve things or tell the reader everything that they need to know because it actually does naturally put questions in their mind that make them curious, that make them want to keep reading, which is exactly what you want to accomplish. And I think that was probably one of the biggest lessons that I learned when I was first starting out as a writer was one sentence can say so much. If you like, I, I was just, uh, Stephanie is my hero and she's currently uh, <laughs> editing my third book. And we just discovered like this little minor plot hole and it was so easy to fix. We didn't have to go back and rewrite anything. We just needed to add a little sentence that brought in that explanation in the important part of the story that it needed to be told and it was done. Um, and um, 
And I think that's kind of freeing because I think sometimes as writers, we think we have to go on and on and on and tell our readers everything that's going on in our head. And we don't just giving them a clue, giving them a little sentence, helping them under to help them understand so they can keep reading is all that's necessary. Yeah, because you can hint it with the one sentence. And then if it needs to be explained further on, weave it in with more detail. Yes. All right. So tip two is begin with the protagonist. You want your readers to meet your main character right away from the first paragraph. They are the introduction to your world for your readers and who they'll get attached to. So don't fall into the world building summary trap, as we just discussed earlier. <laughs> <laughs> this will bog down the beginning of your story and just completely overwhelm the reader. or They'll feel disinterested and they're like, I don't even know who I'm supposed to care about in this moment. So just focus, focus on your protagonist. And I will, again, do another little example. First sentence of the book of The Conjurer's Curse. Rowan clutched his short spear and approached the Thulu jungle. We have character. He's holding a sword, or not a sword, a spear, and he's approaching a jungle. Okay, so now we have a setting. And then the paragraph kind of weaves in more details. But it's good to just start with your character. First line, boom, introduce, introduce him. Well, and instantly you want to have your readers caring about the person who is going to be their main investment in the story. And so you want to give that piece right away. Like, who am I supposed to care about? And why am I going to be championing them throughout the story? Or maybe not championing them. Like, what, what am I supposed <laughs> to be doing? Like, right there at the very beginning, here is the person that um, you're meant to care about and invest in. And I do think that's important so that people aren't like, well, where are we going? Who is the main character? They're mm -hmm. still fishing for all of the information. Just give it to them right off the bat. Yeah. And I know in your third book, you like the, the first line opens with Arthur. Yeah. And he's kind of anxious. So it's like, ooh, in that first sentence, we're feeling a little anxious with our main character. And then it broadens out and we're like, ha, huh, why is he anxious? Yay. Yeah. <laughs> In the action. <laughs> in the action, which you're about to get to. So yes, that, yeah. <laughs> that is tip three. Um, start in medias res. This is Latin for in the middle of the thing or mm. action. So start the story while your character is in action, even if it's as simple as walking down the street or driving somewhere or flying because, you know, it's fantasy. Mm. They could be flying on a dragon. I don't know. Yay. <laughs> I <laughs> love that beginning. <laughs> yes. Oh, pull me in. Ooh, where are yeah. they going? Our eyes are drawn to movement and our attention works the same with a story. So an example I have that I love is Indiana Jones. I'm a huge Indiana Jones fan and Raiders of the Lost Ark starts with Indiana already in a treasure quest. Okay. It like starts with him in the jungle and he's like shadowed as he comes out from all this like jungle brush. And the first thing he does is um, snap his whip <laughs> to, I think, disarm somebody. We're like, dude, is this our hero? Hmm. That's interesting. You don't see a character wielding a whip normally. Okay. And so then that whole sequence, he gets the treasure and there's all this action. But then when we step back to the next scene, we find out he's like a college professor which is really cool. Did we need to know he's a college professor right away? No, that can come later. But in media res, middle of the action, it pulls us in. We want to know more about him. And then we do. We find out he's a college professor, he's a historian, and like a treasure hunter. So it's cool. I love it. Well, and it's a great example of like how you can fold in the details without having to give it all at the beginning. I mean, in that starting scene, we even find out like as he's escaping uh, with the treasure in his hand that he's afraid of snakes. Like there's all these yes! fun little details <laughs> yes. that you get right at the beginning. And I would even say like if you're struggling with how to start your story, watch a few movies that you love. How are they introducing yes. the characters? Because movies and books are, you know, they, they, there's, they're, they're entertaining the person that's reading them. And so there is that similar kind of way of storytelling when you see the impactful start of a story. And I and I have to say this, you know, my heroes are like C.S. Lewis and J.R. Tolkien. 
the way J.R. Tolkien introduces his stories are very slow and very, you know, like describing all of Hobbiton and then what hobbits are like. And that's awesome. And we all love it. But we're not living in the same century even <laughs> as J.R. <laughs> Tolkien. And things have changed. People who read have a different expectation. So, uh, you know, I was very inspired by those books. And so as I started out as a writer, I was thinking, oh, well, I could emulate some of these styles that I love so much, not kind of understanding that now readers really want things to grip them, hook them and take them for a ride immediately. Um, and they don't want all of the introduction. And there are so many clever ways that you can introduce character traits, um, the idea of the story and the, pro the problems that are your, their character is gonna be facing without having to do, he said, the whole info dump right there in the action, right at the beginning, giving us clues yes. and hints um, as yes. to what we're going to be biting into and seeking our teeth into, um, you know, with Indiana Jones. We get all of those clues right there in the first scene. And then as the story goes, we start understanding those clues mm -hmm. and the funny, you know, hero and quirky character of Indiana Jones as the story continues and who he is and why he does what he does. I guess I, I just thought of this, but think of a setting or scene where you can introduce your character that showcases their abilities, their skills, or possibly even their fears. Like if they have yes. a stage fright thing, like you know, and you're writing a middle grade fantasy, like maybe start with your the character freaking out that she has to go up on stage and do <laughs> yeah, see a seeing you know seeing or do something that like it, it terrifies her. So you know it it there are clever ways to showcase your character's skills, traits, habits, all without telling, because you really want to show yes. without, without, you know, not, so don't do it in a summary. I don't really like when stories start with telling the reader, I'm into this, or I like this, or I don't like that. I'm like, can you like right. banter this with a friend, like <laughs> as you're walking to the lockers or something? So that way there's action happening. Yeah. I like what you just said, too, is learning to put some of the information that you need the readers to know, especially in that first chapter in dialogue, whether it's yeah. internal dialogue or it's like characters that are important to the story talking right away. You know, even like even the hooks in the beginning of each chapter um, dialogue is a great way to bring people into the story without having to info dump. Yes, I feel like that's exactly what I did with Rowan and Nausea, his guardian mother in the, in the beginning. I can just hint at a couple of things in the dialogue without having to have it as exposition. Because dialogue's yes. always, dialogue's always going to be more engaging yes. than exposition. Okay, last tip on this one is do not start with your character waking up. <laughs> don't. <laughs> don't. <little> cliche. <laughs> uh, it's boring. It's cliche. You know, later in the story, for sure, you can... You can have a scene where they wake up, but just avoid it for your first chapter. All right. Tip four, establish what the protagonist wants. This is really important. And it is something I look out for as an editor too, which I'll get to later. But for now, readers, they will connect more quickly with your protagonist if they know what the character wants. Now, this may change throughout the story, but there should be an initial want, dream, they have that gives them a reason for the action they're doing in your opening scene. So let's see, I beta read for a book once where I think I got six chapters in and that's an investment. I got six <laughs> chapters in and I still didn't know what the protagonist wanted. Yeah. And I, I totally lost interest and I go to connect with them. It's like, I don't know what her goals are. I don't know what her wishes are, what she wants. She's just like existing in this portal. Like it should have been interesting. It's a portal fantasy. And I'm like, I don't know if she wants to get back. She's happy that she fell through a new land. I don't know. I don't know. Again, you want your reader to really sink their teeth into why they're reading this. And you don't want them to have to wait very long because people will close the book. You want to hook them. You want to hook them right from the start. Have it be a bang um, action. If you're not writing an action book, there's still action. Action doesn't have to be like an action scene, you know, like people fighting monsters or, you know, but moving, being in the action with them, developing that character and really giving them the reason why they're reading this book. 
right off the cuff. Because again, if they're having to wait too long, people are not that patient, unfortunately, especially if they're trying out a new author. You know, if they have read, if, if people are on your bandwagon and they love the previous books that you've written, they're going to give a lot of chances to your next books because they're already invested. They already love you as an author. But if you're a brand new person picking up an author you've never read before, there's there is a level of investment that's just not there. And so you want to give it like immediately right off the punch, introducing that character um, and letting them know what the character wants right off the bat. So we know what we're fighting for, what what's giving us the reason to keep investing into this story. Yes, that is so good. And in the Conjurer's Curse, I do that like on the first page, Rowan, yeah. we, Rowan expresses, I guess, in exposition that he's doing this rite of passage because he wants the validation from the village that he could be recognized as a warrior and one of them and that hopefully they'll stop calling him a Daikili is an outsider so right then we have a want that want will eventually change but in that first opening chapter that is the want in angela's book arthur and the golden dragon right on the first page arthur wants to know why merlin has brought him to Londonium. right did i say that right london london yeah li yeah li yeah <laughs> Londonium. Right. okay so it's like that's that's what he wants to know and he is kept getting frustrated because he doesn't know why he is there. So his burgeoning to like understand why he's here makes us keep reading. Like we want to know just as much as Arthur does why Merlin is keeping a secret from him. So instantly in the action with the character yes. you're discovering as the character is discovering right off the bat. And it does, it gives that edge of like mystery, like, Oh, and you know, Merlin, you know, <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> Merlin and author Arthur, and they're here in Ladonium and they're, they're, going through the city, neither of them like being there, you know, like right off the, the start, we've got the reason why. Yes. Yes. And it reads super well. I, I love Thank that you. opening. Thank you. Thank you. So tip five is weave in theme. Your first chapter should give readers a sense of your story's main theme. Help them feel what the book's message is about in your opening chapter. Mm. And you do this through actions, dialogue, and setting. In The Conjurer's Curse's prologue, I establish Rowan as an outsider and his desire to belong. I show his struggle with shame and the racial prejudices of those around him. Because he's an albino, he is different from everybody in the village, and he feels that weight and he has shame because he's different from everybody. So in that first chapter, those are all the turmoil things that are going on, and it's going to just build as the story goes. So, but I introduce it right away so readers will kind of know what is going to be the conflict yeah that's kind of what i do with merlin in book one the introduction of him is that everything's falling apart he's in grief he doesn't want to keep on living he doesn't want to keep on investing himself in this life he's hidden him himself away on an island of avalon but he's being called to wake up and get over himself and go back to the mainland. And that's really apparent right there at the very beginning in the chapter is that this is where Merlin is at. And this is what he's going to be walking into. So the, and a huge overarching theme to my whole story and my whole series is dealing with grief and the worst possible scenario happening to you and fighting to believe that there is hope on the yes. other side of that. And I give it to you right there in the very first chapter with Merlin. This is where he's at. Yeah, he's in the depths of despair, but we as the readers are like, there's got to be hope. And we are yeah. wishing that for him. And I know that with reader feedback I've gotten with The Conjurer's Curse, it's like in the yeah. first chapter, people have said they just wanted to give Rowan a big hug. Yes, for real. Yes. And I'm like, oh, that's exactly what he needs. But I actually love that that's what you want to do, because that means it tells me you have instantly connected with him. You saw like you feel sorry for him, but you're like, no, like he's just everybody's treating him horribly and he needs a breakthrough and he needs to find where he belongs. And so they are now invested mm -hmm. and they're going to be hoping and wishing that he you know, finds that place to call home. 
Yeah. I mean, and a lot of times when a character leaves home, there's always this like, oh, this is scary. I don't want them to embark on this journey because what's going to happen to them with Rowan? You're like, yes, get a move on. I am get with out you of there. <laughs> on this adventure to like discover that you are loved and valuable and this is not the best life that you could be living. There's, there's better things ahead. All right. Tip six is introduce the main conflict. All right, this doesn't necessarily mean that the antagonist or the villain needs to make an appearance, mm -hmm. but we should at least understand what the story's main conflict is. What, and then also what consequences it is to the main character and maybe hint at the stakes of trying to resolve the conflict. So again, I will give an example from The Conjurer's Curse. In chapter one, the chieftain of the village tells Rowan he needs to search for his people, find the one who cursed him, see if he can break the curse because if he doesn't everyone that he loves will continue to die around him yeah. that is in literally one sentence of dialogue wow. you, the, <laughs> the readers get the entire plot of the story in a piece of dialogue and of course rowan is resistant he doesn't want to leave everything he's known even though it's hostile it's like you have to go you are cursed people are dead but there's still a little bit of hope. I like that the chieftain still kind of gives him hope. Like, yes, just you got to you got to go and see if you can break it or otherwise there's and there's the stakes. You're going to be doomed to kill everyone around you. Yeah. And you do you want that sense of like, again, that investment of, OK, what is going to be the adventure? What is what are they going to have to overcome? Even if they don't, you're not giving them the full revelation. Again, you want to leave an edge of mystery. But we know that what they're about to do or just like merlin he is being called to the mainland like he's gonna go like this decision is that he is gonna go and that this is gonna cause a whole bunch of events to start to unfold and that does kind of introduce the problem he's still reluctant he still doesn't want to go he doesn't want to deal with his grief and mm -hmm. um, but he's being forced to and so it does kind of introduce that main conflict that he continues to wrestle with throughout the rest of the story right so in that case both of ours were like an internal conflict yeah that's what starts or propels the story forward. And then it's in that process and that journey that a, like a antagonist villain conflict is introduced. So I do like that approach too, where we're with the character on an internal journey and then, oh boy, the story grows. And now we have an actual villain that they're gonna have to face. Stephanie has some of the uh, most intense <laughs> villains you learn to love to hate her villains oh gosh story. <laughs> I, I, he makes me cringe and that's funny because speaking of the villain that is who i do start my third book with i do start with the antagonist and it is in medias res all right and we're jumping into his pov which is new for the third book in the iron kingdom series and i think in the very first line it opens with dialogue of him just screaming that he wants he's like i want them found i want them dead okay right then we know what he wants <laughs> it establishes yes. the conflict that he's on the hunt to execute my main characters that's it just starts with a bang so it's in the middle of the action i might i don't know i've gotten some feedback that maybe i need to dial it back and explain some things but then i hear that word explain and i'm like eh, mm. <laughs> eh, i don't want to i don't want to disrupt the flow of chaos that's happening in the yes. scene so i'm i'm getting more feedback from it before i go and like just do rewrites on it so again that we'll get to that that point too of the importance of getting feedback from beta readers for critique partners if they're not yes. if if five critique partners say yeah it was a little too rushed i didn't know what's going on then okay maybe i do need to dial it back but i think the action is engaging so we'll kind of just see we'll see what happens with my first chapter in my third book i love it just you know oh, okay. <laughs> i'm invested so <laughs> yay, yay. <laughs> All right, so that moves us into tip seven, which is save it for later. Your first chapter will probably go through several rewrites to get it right. Give yourself the freedom to be messy or sloppy with it in your first draft, just so you can get the story moving because things may change. Yes. Like as you mm -hmm. get to the ending, you may realize, okay, now I need to actually step back and add in some details or maybe I'm gonna have them start in a different 
place than I thought. So if you just need to get something down so you can kind of get to that catalyst moment, go for it, let it be rough. It doesn't need to be perfect. Yeah, and I think that's such good advice too because I every book I have written, the beginning is always what I have to rewrite the most. <laughs> Especially once yeah. I start getting into the beta readers, it's always that first chapter or that prologue that people are like, mm, this needs to be massaged or this needs to be. And I do think it's it's okay just to get the, the book rolling. Give yourself permission to make that mess and just get it started and rolling. Because once everything else is starting to get written, going back up to work on that um, first chapter is a lot easier. And you know your why even a little more stronger than you did previously. So especially depending on whether you're like me that plots out the whole story. Um, so many things change even with a plotter for me, like as I'm writing the story that help my beginning become so much stronger versus, you know, what Stephanie does where she <laughs> is a pantser. There's so many unknowns that now can help bring some more impact to the beginning once it's been written. So um, being able to give yourself permission yes. to not have to have that perfect, but keeping in mind the pointers that Stephanie's been bringing so that as you write it, you know, you're using that dialogue, you're bringing in the action, you're introducing that antagonist and the problem right off the bat or whatever problem that needs to really hook the reader to invest in that hero. Yes. And I think it's easier to, to establish the theme once you've maybe already written the book. Like you may discover your theme as you're writing it. So then it's like, yay, as you go back for that first rewrite, you're like, now I can weave in those things a little bit and I can hint at stuff. I can foreshadow conflicts. Yes. So I love it. It's like a puzzle. All right. So those are our tips. Now we are going to go to the editor's corner because I'm an editor and a proofreader. So I have some tips that I want you to like be mindful of from an editor's standpoint as to just a reader. So when I am beginning to edit a manuscript, as Angela said, like the first chapter is the thing that we kind of rewrite the most. It's also the thing that I'm going to scrutinize the most as an editor. And I am definitely looking for active voice. I want to see action verbs. I want to see your character moving, doing things. I don't want to see references to past events, meaning I don't want to see had, had been, has been, was too much. I don't want to see things that are alluding to something that has happened before. I want to be media res. What's happening now? Your opening chapter should not read like a summary. This is important if you have a prologue. Now, I've heard that editors and certain publishers like don't like don't like prologues. And I think the reason that is is because they get a bad rap for reading like a summary or an info dump. So yeah. if you are going to do a prologue, just make sure it's in media res scene that's kind of integral to the story. My opening chapter is a prologue in the Conjurer's Curse, and it establishes those things we've mentioned in the past, like the, the rite of passage, he wants validation, we see the prejudice from the villagers, and so by the time chapter one starts, we kind of know what he's been living through, and then bang, we have our catalyst moment that propels him on his adventure. So I'm also looking for character motivations being established. Again, mm -hmm. this may change, but there should be an initial want in that first chapter. And is there something preventing them from getting it? That That's important too. Um, another thing is don't start with a flashback. If it's the first book in a series, like don't, don't start with a flashback. Second or third book, like you could, I think you could do that, especially if you do it in media res. So that's just, that's the big takeaway. <laughs> Have everything be in media res when you start, when you start your book. You want to ground readers in the setting before you take them on a backwards leap through time. And so that is why the rule yeah. of thumb, if you are going to like do a flashback in your story, wait until at least three chapters in, because we don't want to stop that forward momentum by oh, lurch back. Here's a, there's a little backflash for you. Like, just wait until we've the readers know the character a bit more before we take them back like 10 years or, or five years. And I, so as an editor, I recently 
in a book where the opening chapter was a prologue, but the whole thing read as a summary. And this was a book that was written in first person, but I didn't know that until I got to their second chapter, which switched to first person. The, the prologue was written in like this past tense and it was a summary. And so I'm like, okay, well, this seems like as a reader, I would want to connect with this character and feel the emotions. And I'm not like it opens with basically this girl gets kind of dumped at a prom, you know, she was like tricked, just tricks like this boy's like invites her, you know, like be my date for the prom. And then like, actually it was a kind of a prank and she gets there and actually he hadn't, he was with another girl. So she's crushed, but I'm like, I don't feel crushed because this was written in an exposition summary. So my advice was this whole thing has to be rewritten to be in media's res. Wow. Yes. <laughs> Let's put it put it in the action. Let's be there with her in this scene. Let's do the lead up. Let's do the build up. She's excited. She's going to a prom. She's going to search for a dress. She's getting excited. And then bam, here comes the like drop. And it's like, ah, now I feel gut punched. <laughs> yes. Like she did. So that's, that's just an important thing to remember. Don't, don't have, a, if you're going to do a prologue, don't have a read like a summary. Yeah, and I love um, what you said too, is don't be afraid to rewrite. I think sometimes that can seem so intimidating, especially if you haven't, you know, if this is your first book and you haven't had to do the whole rewrite process, getting good critique partners is so important. Getting people who will tell you the truth, but actually care mm -hmm. about your writing is really important. So you want to have people who care about your writing, who are giving you critiques because you don't want people who are tearing you to pieces and making you feel like you can't <laughs> write or that your story has, you know, no potential to go anywhere. You want people who are cheerleading you, but taking those critiques and not being afraid to rewrite them and make them into gold. Um, I think I've met so many people who are afraid of the editing process. So you've got the editor's corner and they're like, no, 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 I'm afraid of my, my story being picked apart. And yet that is probably the best thing for you as a writer is to be refined by other people reading your work and teaching you the things that maybe you didn't know about the craft of writing. I learned so much on my first book from people being honest with me. It actually helped me become the writer that I am now writing the books that I am now because I had people who were willing to look at my work and tell me the truth. So don't be afraid of that. Don't be afraid of rewrites. Don't be afraid of having to completely restructure a, a first chapter because it doesn't mm -hmm. have some of the elements that we're talking about. So when, even as Stephanie's talking, I'm like, with my new book, I'm like, oh, I kind of did that. <laughs> <laughs> you know, and you're like, hmm, does it need to change? Maybe, or maybe I can move it somewhere else, you know? So I think that those things are always kind of happening and, um, and it's good to hear those things and be thinking about how to apply that to your writing. Yes. So uh, my editor for my first book, The Conjurer's Curse, I had like alluded to something, a past event. And she's like, hmm, this is problematic. We need to cut this. And I didn't like know all these tips at the time. So I was like, okay, I will restructure this. Ooh, and it does seem scary in that moment. Like, oh gosh, uh, I'm not sure if I can do this, but you can just get those things out that bog down, slow it down. And it did, it wasn't necessary and it wasn't needed. So I'm glad that I had an editor who could say, nope, you don't need a hat. Don't allude to anything that's happened before. Readers know that your character has had a life before yes. the book has started. So you don't have to explain all those things. So they will discover it as they read along. And again, don't be afraid to cut your darlings. I'm sure if you've been around the writing community, you have probably heard that. When I was querying for The Conjurer's Curse, I had an agent who liked my query on, I was doing a Twitter pick contest, and they, they read my prologue or they read like maybe the first two chapters. And they did not like the pacing. They said it, mm. I jumped too much, like um, time wise. So I got feedback from one of my critique partners and I was like, my prologue, oh my gosh, like I do jump from like when Rowan's 10 and then to he's 13, like maybe I should cut it. And she's like, yeah, cut it. And I was like, <laughs> okay, done. I cut the whole first scene. Did I love it? Yes. Like, and it was still in media's res. It was in the action. but. 
it's true. It was, it wasn't necessary. I could allude to it later in the story that that had happened. So, you know, it's all a learning experience and be teachable when it comes to people giving you feedback and giving you critiques that you want your story to be the best that it can be. And people are going to challenge you. So if you're going to be, if you are resistant a little bit, just like mm, step back, give it a day or two and then come back and you might with fresh lens, realize that person has a point. <laughs> yes. And you just didn't want to like change something, but you're like, no, yeah. they're, they're right. And if I just tweak it, if I just add this, it will, you know, bring the stakes higher or will make sense. Yes. And the readers are going to connect better. Well, and, you know, there's something magical about when you, you know, removed those, you know, someone suggested to remove something that you loved so much about your book. There's something magical about the fact that it was there or it used to be there. Mm -hmm. There's something about it that when someone's reading your book, it's like they know that there was something there. And um, so it wasn't a waste of time writing those scenes and developing that world, even if it doesn't make it into the main story it still exists and the readers can feel it. And you actually want them to kind of have that sense of more history when they're reading their your mm -hmm. book, because it gives them a bigger sense of the world. And there is in just in marketing wise, it's so great to have free things to give away, to market your book, to have um, just things to get people to sign up for your newsletter. And short stories are an amazing way to do this. If there are huge chunks or huge scenes that you have had to remove out of your book, consider making those fun short stories that your readers who have jumped on your bandwagon get to have and enjoy later on as like a gold nugget um, yeah. that, you know, they can take um, because they've supported you and they're following you. So those kinds of things are kind of great to have. So I had entire stories uh, deleted out of my first version <laughs> of Eleanor and the Song of the Bard. And some of those stories I removed and it was painful, ended up later on in the series. And it made a lot more sense later on in the series. And I'm so glad they got removed, even though it was painful when um, I first realized they needed to come out. And then there were other parts where I'm like, oh my gosh, I could make this an entire short story that I can use mm. as a lead generator for um, people who follow me. So um, remember that, that those pieces don't have to necessarily disappear entirely. They just don't belong where they are. And um, uh, who knows what you can use them for in the future. That's true. I've always played the idea of maybe that little scene that got deleted could wind up as a flashback yes. <laughs> later on in the series. So it's still in the back yeah. of my mind. As yeah. Angela said, like nothing is never... Was, was a waste of time. Yeah. yeah. It, it never, it never, anything you write never is. Yeah. It's so true. And we are really hoping that as the Ink Mages, that we're really equipping you to write and explore and be ready to put your books out there for people to read. Let us know in the comments if there's something that you would like to know about as far as the craft of writing, um, developing your characters. We would love to discuss this, put it on the show, give you even more of a clue just where we're at in our journey as writers and really help you go on this journey of getting that first book published. Leave us a like, share our podcast, let other people know that you're listening, um, subscribe, and we cannot wait to see you next time. Mm -hmm.